The star of Bethlehem, which may have been an exploding body far out in space, still captures the imagination of man today. The three wise men who followed the star to the cradle of Christianity remain a symbol of man's unending endeavor to seek out the mysteries of the skies above him. Today, almost 2,000 years after the wise men's journey, modern man's interest in the universe is dramatized by his fascination with space travel. The younger generation, too, finds this subject filled with exciting possibilities. For the boys of today, the space suit has replaced the cowboy outfit of an earlier year. And the dream of a rocket trip to some distant planet has outdated the old-fashioned desire to fly a plane around the world. Today, man can see deep into space. He can photograph celestial bodies and even other universes millions of light years away as he continues his age-old effort to push back the boundaries of the world he lives in. At an observatory in the high altitudes of the Colorado Rocky Mountains, scientists use a coronagraph to produce artificial eclipses of the sun, hub of our universe, and to photograph the constant spectacular gaseous explosions on its flaming surface. Eruptions which leap as far as 300,000 miles above the sun's rim. These boiling flares on the sun lend support to the theory that man's own Earth was born in a solar explosion similar to these. Curious about science's new discoveries concerning the universe, increasing numbers of laymen today are attracted to institutions like New York City's Hayden Planetarium where scientific facts are translated into entertaining and educational shows which provide an exciting glimpse into the future. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Hayden Planetarium. Today we're going to make an imaginary rocket trip out to the moon. We're going to travel across about 239,000 miles of space, and from that position we'll look back to see the Earth as a glowing globe, the huge planet that it is. Now I'd like to have you all apply your collective imaginations. Let's picture ourselves within this rocket ship. Very soon we'll be hearing from the control tower with orders to take off on a trip to the moon. Control to engineer. Secure all hatches. Hatches secured, sir. Attention, pilot and all crew. Pilot and all crew, prepare for takeoff. Stand by for time beat. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Rocket away. As the expanding image of the moon is flashed on the planetarium dome, these spectators get a suggestion of what it would be like to speed toward the moon in a rocket ship. At Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., as in most other universities, a more formal study of the moon and other objects in the solar system still provides the basis of astronomical education. Georgetown astronomy students learn early in their training the position and character of the planets from the director of Georgetown's astronomy department, Father Francis J. Hyden. The first one is the planet Mars. Would you put the lights out, please? This planet never comes any nearer than 40 million miles to the Earth. And it is at that time that we are able to see it at its best. And now, I think, if we can have the lights, we'll go upstairs and take a look at the planet Jupiter through our telescope. The students look forward to this moment when the laboratory phase of their class takes them to the observatory's dome.
this telescope, of course, is considerably larger than the little one-inch telescope which Galileo was able to carry over his shoulder and hold up to the sky without any support, perhaps. And uh, Mr. Burney, if you'll take charge of the motor for turning the dome, Mr. Harrington, if you'll open the shutter, I think why we shall get underway. Today's college classroom and the information that is passed on there about the universe that surrounds man illustrates dramatically the great progress made in the science of astronomy in the last 400 years. For today's student knows more about the bodies in the Earth's solar system than Columbus knew about the new world when he set out to find it. But the equipment to which the student has access today is useful only in the most elementary study of the bodies closest to the Earth. On Palomar Mountain near Pasadena, California, modern science's most powerful eye for peering into the vast regions of space is the 200-inch Hale Telescope. This great instrument, one of the most precise engineering mechanisms yet developed, probes to a point in space one billion light years beyond the Earth. The top of the 12-story dome opens, and a technician at the controls maneuvers the one million pound instrument easily into position. A specially designed elevator lifts the scientific observer to the cylindrical cage in the telescope tube. He is then in what is called prime focus position. This Hale telescope is used for photographing various parts of the universe every clear night of the year. It has been in operation since 1948. As the elevator descends, a final adjustment of position is made to enable the astronomer to get a perfect shot of his subject. Palomar's telescope, with its great magnification and light gathering power, is used almost entirely as a camera. An adjustable diaphragm acts as a variable stop setting, just as in an ordinary camera. In a time exposure just a few minutes long, many hundreds of stars can be recorded, stars which the eye could never see directly. For the most part, the Hale telescope has been used to photograph the stars and nebulae many millions of light years distant from our own solar system. But recently, its great lens was trained on the Earth's nearest neighbors, the moon and the planets which, with the Earth, revolve around the sun. Mount Palomar Observatory has just released photographs of this newsworthy experiment. One of the most spectacular shots taken is that of the planet Saturn and its famous rings, 170,000 miles in diameter, but only 10 miles thick. At the Naval Research Laboratory outside Washington, D.C., scientists are studying a new kind of astronomy called radio astronomy. This large saucer-shaped antenna, 50 feet in diameter, sits atop one of the Navy's buildings and scans the sky to pick up cosmic noises made by stars which cannot be seen, but which can be heard. Already, more than 100 such stars have been discovered. Not only invisible stars give off radio waves, however. The sun and other visible stars send radio signals of their own. The narrow beam of the radio telescope's antenna can sweep across the surface of the sun, for instance, and pick up information about the sun that visibility alone cannot give. Inside an adjoining building where a remote control unit directs the movements of the antenna, Dr. John P. Hagen follows the record made by a signal from the sun. It shows the temperature of a region deep in the sun's atmosphere. The Naval Research Laboratory is also involved, along with other branches of the military establishment, in another kind of exploration of the universe. 
the government's rocket project. One of the men most familiar with this operation is the director of the Navy's Viking rocket project, Milton Rosen. Since the end of the Second World War, the government of the United States has been probing into space with its great new rockets. Although these rockets have been designed and built with the purpose in mind of developing better weapons for defense, they are nonetheless our first explorers of space, and in their flights we can see how far back these space frontiers have been pushed today. In many respects, the rocket capital of the United States is White Sands Proving Ground in New Mexico, where rocket vehicles designed and built in widely different parts of the country are tested and fired. At White Sands, the Army's V-2 rocket was the first U.S. missile to prove the success of high-altitude rocket experimentation. Building rockets, however, has been slow and often heartbreaking work. For every missile that successfully lifts itself into space, there have been many discouraging setbacks and many failures. Static firing of the rocket motor in a test stand in the New Mexico mountains is an important part of the rocket's preparation for flight. It takes many tons of thrust to lift a rocket off the earth. The powerful flame giving off a heat of 2400 degrees turns the vanes which control the rocket in flight into white hot pieces of graphite. Even with the tremendous achievements that have been made, we have only scratched the surface of what must be done before we can build a vehicle that can carry men into outer space and return them safely to the Earth's surface. Take the moon, for instance. The moon is the first foreign body that man will presumably try to reach. The moon is 238,000 miles away from us. How much of this distance has man covered already? The Navy's Viking rocket reached an altitude of 138 miles, the highest altitude achieved by a single-stage rocket. The WAC Corporal, a small rocket fired from the nose of the Army's V-2 while in flight, is the most ambitious two-stage rocket yet attempted. It reached a height of 250 miles. In terms of engineering achievement, we have a long way with these machines. In terms of a trip to the moon, we have hardly lifted ourselves above the ground. Ninety-nine and nine-tenths percent of the distance to the moon remains untraversed by any man-made machine. The problems of human engineering that must be considered before we can hope to travel in space are enough to stagger the imagination. At the Air Force's Aero Medical Field Laboratory in Holloman Field, New Mexico, research is conducted on problems that would affect living cells in space. Mice are used to determine the effect of weightlessness in space on living beings. A camera is installed in the rocket to record their reactions. A monkey was placed in the rocket chamber too, but was not photographed. Experiments like this are necessary for medical science to determine the probable effect on man himself when he finally reaches outer space. For man today has achieved a height of only 15 miles, and above that, little is known of his ability to travel. In the control shack, the final preparations are made for the rocket flight which will carry the animals many miles higher than man has attained himself. At the control board inside the blockhouse, technicians study a radio recording of the physical reactions of the animals in flight. 
the signals are transmitted by radio waves from the rocket. The speed of the falling rocket, 2,000 miles an hour, offsets the pull of gravity, and the mice are weightless. The mouse farther from the camera has a perch to hold to, but the mouse closer to the camera simply bounces around inside his container. The camera is catching the mice's reactions from the side of their transparent containers. The normal center of gravity is at the bottom of the screen. A parachute attached to the animal cylinder opens as the cylinder is ejected from the falling rocket, which plunges to the earth. With the cylinder speed checked by the parachute, the animals inside are returned to normal gravity conditions. As the cylinder approaches the earth, the mice regain their weight and settle once more at the bottom of their container. Though these tests provide the scientists with revealing information, the reactions of the mice are not necessarily indicative of what man's reactions will be. The cylinder lands in the New Mexico desert, several miles from the spot where the rocket was launched. A helicopter brings the technicians to the spot so they can examine the animals as quickly as possible after their flight, which attained the height of 38 miles from the Earth's surface. The mice are slightly dazed, but none the worse for the experience. At the Naval Air Development Center in Johnsville, Pennsylvania, another kind of experiment is conducted relating to man's ability to travel into space. A volunteer is strapped into the cockpit of a 50-foot arm called the centrifuge, which will measure his ability to stand high-speed acceleration. Doctors examine his condition before he begins his test. Instruments to measure his breathing and heartbeat and to record the action of his brain are strapped in with him. As the door to the chamber closes behind the examining personnel, the subject is left alone, ready to submit himself to pressure similar to what he would experience if he ever traveled in a rocket above the atmosphere. Driven by a 4,000 horsepower motor, the long arm of the centrifuge revolves in a circle 100 feet in diameter, slowly at first, but gradually gaining speed. Inside the gondola, a force of several times the normal weight of gravity pulls the subject. Every part of his body grows unnaturally heavy. At a recorder in a nearby room, medical personnel keep close watch on the man's physical reactions. The machine can be stopped at any time if necessary. The centrifuge is capable of a speed of 178 miles per hour. But at present, no man can travel at that speed in so small a circle and survive. This experiment has contributed valuable medical information about man's ability to fly high-speed jet planes. This volunteer finished the experiment in good physical condition. With these experiments, officials at Johnsville are trying to anticipate the conditions under which man will travel in rocket or jet aircraft in terms of interplanetary flight or flights outside the Earth's atmosphere. Men like this volunteer are furnishing medical science with the basic research needed in determining whether man can survive in outer space. Experiments like these bring man closer to the day when he may venture into the far reaches of this universe. The greatest modern contribution to man's understanding of his universe has been made by Dr. Albert Einstein, who has spent his life developing theories to explain the forces governing the functioning of the universe. Some of these theories are today on the verge of being proven by practical experiments. Although man has not yet risen more than 15 miles from his Earth, he knows how this planet will look below him when he finally ventures beyond that height. A movie camera, installed in this V-2 rocket, is about to record the most graphic actual pictures yet taken of how the Earth looks from a point in space. Above the sands of New Mexico, the rocket thrusts into space at more than 3,000 miles an hour. The rocket will climb to 20 miles, using up its 9.5 tons of fuel. Under the momentum of its initial thrust, 
the rocket will continue upward to a height of 60 miles. It will then turn end over end as it passes the peak of its trajectory. Then it will plunge back to Earth. Inside the rocket, the camera focuses on the Earth, receding into the distance below. The action recorded by the camera has been slowed down so that the details on the Earth's surface can be viewed more clearly. The rocket reaches its first 20 miles and expends its fuel during its first 60 seconds of flight. Now the rocket is traveling upward on its momentum for some 40 miles more. Here the camera action is stopped as we see below the Rio Grande Valley and the mountains of the continental divide beyond. This film is being recorded by the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory under the sponsorship of the United States Navy. Here, 60 miles above the Earth, the rocket has reached the stratum where the atmosphere is so thin that it affords the rocket no support in its course. While it maintains its trajectory, the rocket itself spins end over end. Thus, the camera is pointing at the Earth one moment and at the Sun the next. Part of the time, it is photographing empty space. The rocket is still climbing as it spins, giving us a dramatic view of the sphere called Earth. The rocket is moving at a speed of about a mile a second. The opportunity to see the world from this 20th century vantage point in space was not afforded the 15th century navigators who were convinced the Earth was flat. Scientists today know little of what a man's reactions would be, assuming that our technical development makes it possible one day for man to survive in a rocket at this height. He may grow exhilarated or depressed. His psychological reactions are completely unpredictable. When it is pointed earthward in the spinning rocket, the camera always films the same area of the world. The plains of Texas, the hills of New Mexico and Wyoming, and the fertile valleys of California. The rocket is still spinning as it approaches the peak of its trajectory. We are now more than 70 miles up. the top and the film is stopped to show you how the earth looks from 76 miles up. Still spinning, the rocket starts its descent to earth. The camera sweeps from Mexico in the south to the northern United States, far to the east and west to the Pacific. The rocket continues spinning for some distance on its plunge earthward. Seven hundred miles to the west, the Gulf of California and adjoining Arizona lie just this side of the horizon. The rocket plummets to its crash in the New Mexico desert. But the protected camera preserves the film which has recorded this pioneering exploration of the universe in which we live. Time marches on.